Hi guys and welcome to today's video where I'll be talking you through reptile health and the vitamins and minerals they need to function correctly. You see much thought and emphasis is put on to supplying calcium and vitamin D3, however a lot of people think that's all reptiles need when in reality there's an array of vitamins and minerals that they'd get in the wild but miss out on in captivity and this is why we supplement their food. So let's start off with vitamins and by the way I will try to be brief on the vitamins and minerals in this video because there's a lot to get through. So vitamins can be separated into two groups, fat soluble and water soluble. Now fat soluble vitamins cannot be dissolved in water, they're absorbed by the body and stored in fatty tissue and in and around organs such as the eyes and liver. This means the body can store and then release them as needed for future use. Unlike water soluble vitamins which are not stored long term and need to be replaced more regularly. The downside to fat soluble vitamins is that as they are stored they can be oversupplied which could lead to toxicity and a number of other negative side effects. So what are the fat soluble vitamins and what do they do? First we have vitamin A. It plays an important role in vision and a healthy immune system. Vitamin A is provided as a preformed source via the organs of vertebrate food items or via the ingestion of eggs. It can also be made in a self-regulated way within the body when the full spectrum of natural carotenoids are consumed. These are found in plants and are either directly eaten or provided via the gut content of insects. Then we have a fairly well-known vitamin, vitamin D. The most common compounds are vitamin D2 and D3. Now D2 is certainly beneficial to plant eaters as it usually occurs in plants and certain mushrooms after exposure to the sun, but it does not allow the natural assimilation, storage and use of minerals such as calcium, whereas vitamin D3 plays a major role in the D3 to calcium, magnesium and phosphorus cycles. Vitamin D3 is essential to life in its own right, working with and allowing for almost every other biological cycle within the body. It also aids in the absorption of calcium, magnesium and phosphate. Next we have vitamin E. Vitamin E is needed to maintain healthy skin and works within the brain, nerve and reproductive cycles. It's also linked into the D3 and A cycles. And finally we have vitamin K. This vitamin helps to ensure effective blood clotting as well as working alongside calcium and phosphorus for good bone production and maintenance. Now as I said the correct provision of these nutrients are all essential to maintain a well functioning reptile. But an oversupply can be just as dangerous as an undersupply. So for example, switching from synthetic D3 to a well thought out UV system can help to eliminate vitamin D related problems as a reptile can self regulate, but only if the animal has access to the correct quantity of energy within terrestrial UV or UV index. Now onto water soluble vitamins. So first we have the vitamin B group. There are actually eight types of vitamin B and to be honest with you, most of these I'd completely butcher their names if I read out loud. Uh, but in general, the vitamin B group work together with the same aim, production and maintenance of the immune system, producing red blood cells, bone and skin, as well as having a positive effect on the brain and nervous system. Now B vitamins arrive via the ingestion of food and water and even via soil particles sticking to the food or the plants or even in water. Some are also provided once again when an animal is eating off of a vertebrate food source. For example, it's well documented that leopard geckos will eat other small reptiles, even their own hatchlings in the wild, nest fallen birds and other small mammals. And finally, we have vitamin C. Now, interestingly, unlike us humans, reptiles can make their own vitamin C within their body, just outside of the kidneys. This should mean additional supplementing is not needed. However, in times of serious stress, disease, or the introduction of certain medicines, a dose of vitamin C may be required. So now on to minerals. <laughs> uh, like the vitamins, I will try to be brief on their description as there's a lot to get through, but I would encourage you to do further research on each if you are interested. 
So first we have calcium. Now calcium is literally one of the building blocks of life. It is the fifth most common element on earth. Once again, it works in a calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, D3 cycle, where as well as bone health, it also helps with blood flow, muscle contraction, nerve, brain, cardiac health, and blood clotting. Next we have copper. Copper works with zinc to ensure good thyroid function. It also works with and allows hemoglobin to carry oxygen around the body and it's essential for bone growth and the growth and replacement of collagens. Iodine is next. It is also essential to good thyroid health and an undersupply of this can cause symptoms such as lethargy, swelling, poor bone health and poor sexual reproduction. Then we have iron, which has many jobs such as production of haemoglobin and the building of bones and muscle tissue. Magnesium is the next mineral. Now this actually plays a very important role in the absorption of calcium as part of the D3 cycle, as it instructs calcium to be stored deep in the bones, where it is then further processed before being sent into the blood. So without magnesium, calcium can actually flow freely around the blood, clogging up veins and arteries and all being stored in the wrong places, such as deep tissues and around organs. Magnesium is also vital within nerve, digestive and reproductive health. Then we have phosphorus, which works with calcium to help with good bone growth. Potassium, which is essential for helping to build and maintain muscle health, blood and cellular health and regulating the central nervous system. Then we have selenium. Selenium mainly works to protect cell membranes and aids with cellular structure, production and repair. Then there is sodium. Reptiles do not need tons of this, like us humans, too much salt is not good, but it does help with maintaining blood viscosity and pressure, healthy muscle contractions and maintaining blood flow to kidneys and liver. And finally, zinc. Now a lack of zinc can cause shedding problems, fatigue and poor bone growth. Zinc aids in the correct assimilation and use of vitamin A. So there we have it, all the vitamins and minerals that our reptiles need. Now, I won't go into supplementing today because that's a whole nother video, but what I will say is since switching to using a UV light and these particular non-toxic natural supplements, honestly, this is not sponsored, supplementing my geckos have never been easier and less risky because obviously when you're dealing with synthetics and a lack of clear dosage per species, per weight group, for example, it is more risky. If you ask a lot of these companies, they don't really know what the right dosage is. For example, I could dust 10 crickets in some supplements, give them to my gecko, but also give them to a bearded dragon. It's the same dosage, but completely different animals. So as you can see, there is, there is a risk there, but no doubt they do work to an extent. But if you've been following my channel for a while now, you know I am striving to give my captive reptiles as much as a wild-like life in terms of supplementing and substrate and UV and heat and so on. So that's where I'm striving and that's where things are going here. Um, it's totally fine to use synthetic still. I use them for many years, but this is just where I'm going. So that's why I mention this stuff a lot. I hope this hasn't worried you too much in terms of what you need to give your reptiles. Just don't go dusting every feed with a vitamin and mineral powder unless it's like this one where it's non-toxic because your geckos will be oversupplied. Now I did do a supplementing schedule a while back. This was more of a guide, sort of like what I always did. I, I kept repeating myself to everyone about, well, when my geckos were younger, this was what I did. So then I was like, okay, wait, I need to just write this down for people. As just sort of an idea, a guide of what to use and when to use it. I would say if you have a particular supplement you're using by a brand, um, if you are really confused, contact them. Sadly, I don't know tons about every single type of supplement out there. I'm pretty sure Arcadia are the only ones that have the non-toxic one. I'm pretty sure most of the others have synthetics in, I may be wrong, but that doesn't mean you can't use them, just, I know this is a, it can be, like feel like a complicated subject, but what I wanna just bring awareness to is that just giving your reptile calcium and D3 just is not enough. Anyway, if you've watched all of this, thank you, because I know it's been very long, um, but, you know, it is a large part of reptile keeping that sadly many people ignore and then the animal suffers. Anyway, on that bright note, uh, if you haven't already, please subscribe. I post every four days, but thank you for watching guys and goodbye.